Hello and welcome for those that are joining. Uh, we will be starting here in just a minute as, as folks uh, dial in and get their audio connected. For those of you that are just joining, we'll be starting in about 30 seconds, just letting a few more folks dial in and get their audio set up. So hello and welcome to Pandemic Pivots. I am your host, George Cook. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Honeycomb Credit. Uh, in this series, we highlight and interview some of the leading small business owners uh, that we know and, and talk about the creative ways that they've shifted their business models through the pandemic. Uh, in episode three, I am thrilled to be joined by Nisha Blackwell, the founder of Knott's Land. One of my favorite small businesses, as you can see by this awesome bow tie that I'm wearing right now. Um, Knotsland is an artisan bow tie company based here in Pittsburgh. They repurpose discarded fabric and turn them into amazing bow ties. Uh, they've been featured in by Google, by YouTube. They were a member of the Facebook Small Business Council, uh, and they've built just such a cool brand. Um, so today we're going to learn uh, from Nisha about how she built this brand, how she built this equitable circular economy uh, business, um, how she employed a really cool uh, work from home model, uh, and how she pivoted her operations through the pandemic. Uh, before we jump into the interview, I would like to just say a few words about Honeycomb. Um, so Honeycomb Credit is a loan crowdfunding platform. We allow locally owned small businesses to access fair capital by borrowing directly from their own customers and community members and fans. So this not only unlocks capital for small businesses, but at the same time also levels up the customers who now have financial and emotional buy-in in the business and, and really become evangelists for the brands of the businesses they're investing in. So with all of that said, I am so excited to introduce Nisha Blackwell. Nisha, thank you for joining us today on Pandemic Pivots. Oh, I think, I think you're on uh, mute, Nisha. Whoops, sorry about that. Yeah, I was saying thank you so much for having me. It's, it's so great to you know, be in community with an a amazing, <laughs> amazing community resource. So it's, it's exciting. Awesome. Well, so I, I gave a little bit of an introduction to, to Knotsland, but tell us about the business. Give us, give us the elevator pitch. Tell us a little bit how you got started, when you got started, and, and uh, why, why you decided to build Knotsland. Yeah, so Knotsland is a five-year-old company um, founded in 2015. Really, I always say that I stumbled into entrepreneurship. Um, I was met with a, a dilemma where I had been recently laid off and in nursing school and I had a friend's daughter's birthday coming up and I really wanted to do something special for her daughter and I didn't really have the funds or resources to do it um, but I really did have the resources because that's when I looked around me and said okay I have a bag of thrifted items and I also have a sewing machine that I never opened that I was like super duper afraid to open and so I, I took these two things and I 
figured out something to do. And the first thing I did was teach myself how to sew um, using YouTube and started to seam rip and break down the fabrics and materials that I had. And by the end of the night, which was about like eight hours later, I ended up being able to sew um, hair bows. And um, in making these hair bows, I didn't really anticipate going into business. I was like, you know, I'm doing something really special uh, for other people. And I think it speaks to just like now reflecting on it often, I think about how it speaks to my motivation and, and I generally am more motivated to do things when I'm doing something for other people. So I uh, reached in this bag and got the, the thrifted items and taught myself how to sew these hair bows and went to a birthday party um, the next day. And I was super duper nervous about <laughs> just taking this handmade thing to a party. Um, and I went up to my friend and remember being like, hey, uh, yeah, we open this box. Don't be surprised because there are some handmade goods in there. And she's like, oh, don't worry. I'm just happy that you came and, that, and you know, that you showed up and you're here. Uh, and when, you know, you know, the time during the birthday party when the kids gather around and all the parents gather around and watch the kid open the gifts. <laughs> um, I was super anxious again because I'm like, oh my gosh, they're all going to be like broken apart in pieces of fabric in this box because I just taught myself how to do this thing. And it was actually surprisingly the reverse. Um, the parents just switched. The baby spilled the box out onto the high chair and the parents were just like, oh my gosh, all of the oohs and ahs. And people got really excited about the product. And I left that, that customer with like six, and seven, six to seven customers, left that party with 67 customers. And that's what started my entrepreneurial journey. <laughs> That is so cool. So, so how long have you been running Nutsland? You know, you, that was the, the genesis. How did you build from there? Yeah, so actually the hair bows were, um, that was in 2014. So we officially started, we, I supported myself for a whole summer with the hair bows. And then I had a friend come to me and say like, what if you, you know, took and, and, and created something else. We had parents asking for items and parents specifically asking for items for little boys. And I um, sort of came up on this, this bow tie idea. It felt like a natural progression, but also there was a lot of research and development that went into just the product itself because I knew that to go from hair bows to bow ties, I had to do it in a way that felt like, you know, like we're going from like this like cute, girl identifying product to this um, structured historical. <laughs> I mean, there's so many things tied to bow ties that you, if you're gonna do them, you have to do them right. So I remember just sort of taking the money from the hair bows and investing into the research and development of the bow tie. I bought tons of bow ties and looked at them and looked at what I would do better, what I would you know, fix. And we sent a bunch of kids to school at the beginning of the school year wearing our bow ties. So, you know, the kids market was our first market and it's an amazing test market because once you see, you know, that they're still in one piece after a day's worth of <laughs> wrestling and rumbling in school, um, kids aren't worried about their bow tie staying put together. So it was a great test market and a great test in like what could potentially be a good product. And after that, you know, we just, it start, we started getting cus custom requests from fathers and dads like saying, hey, can you make me one and matching sets and really cool things. And that's when another friend of mine was like, you know, there's a startup accelerator in town. Um, you should check it out and you should apply with your um, bow ties. There's, they're all sustainable. And, you know, to go from the hair bows to the bow ties, I knew that I wanted to keep the same um, source because I'm like, you know, there's fabric already here. Why should I go and buy more fabric when I can use the things that have already been created? Um, just like full disclaimer, I had been on a sustainability journey before that and had knew a lot about like climate change and how it affect, um, affected our communities and, and just our world and, and had been knee deep in that. So I was really aware that I wanted to keep sustainable um, practices and sustainability embedded into the company moving forward. So 
store. Yeah, she's like, you have this great idea of these sustainably made bow ties and you should just go and pitch. And I didn't think so because I'm like, I'm a maker, you know, I'm, I'm making things and, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay just making. And she's like, no, you should apply, you should apply. And then, so we applied and to our surprise, we got accepted into the startup program, um, the startup accelerator program. And we were able to raise some seed funding. And from there, mentorship, our first space, our first desk outside of my living room where I was making the products. Um, and that was the first moment of seeing ourselves as like a, a company, like, you know, once you're invested in and you get that validation and, you know, that sort, sort of becomes like the official sign off, like folks believe in us enough to give us some money to do this. So we're going to just keep going and keep going. So Five years later, we're here um, in our uh, studio storefront um, in Wilkinsburg. We moved in in 2019 and have just been steadily growing pre-COVID. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I really admire uh, about your business niches is how well you, you've built an online presence, especially for a physical, tangible product. So can you walk us through that, that process a little bit? You, you, you built these beautiful, you made these beautiful products and, and you, you were starting to distribute. How did you take that, that uh, offline product and, and build such a strong brand digitally? And, and what advice might you give to, to other business owners thinking about their own online presence? Yeah, so, you know, from the jump, um, our mentors and the accelerator said, make sure you get your Instagram, get your Facebook, get your, your um, e-commerce site started. And we actually started on Big Cartel, which is like, whoo, that was a hard site to navigate, but we started there. So, you know, we, at the same time as I was like at shows and at markets, we still had a online presence. It wasn't really utilized because I didn't know how to use, utilize it in the best way, um, especially like our online, like our e-commerce, uh, like our website. Um, Instagram was great because folks that would see us at shows would turn around and like follow us on Instagram. So it started off as very organic. Like we were utilizing this like dual strategy of like we're, seeing people in person, handing out business cards, telling people, you know, you may not want to purchase right now, but you can purchase later. Follow us on Instagram for all of our cool designs. And at the time, everything was one of a kind. So we created this sort of demand where it was like, you know, if you see something, you may want to get it now. And so I think there, there was some synergy there. But um, as far as advice, I would definitely say um, Instagram is so powerful for a physical like a, a very visual, visual good, um, it almost acted as a, as sort of like a um, lookbook for us without having to like physically give out a bunch of lookbooks. Um, so my advice would definitely be to utilize Instagram. And we, we also utilize Facebook for different reasons. And that's more about the storytelling and the connecting with um, customers in a different kind of way. So the, the and all of this really is supposed to lead to conversions, right? So you develop that customer base. You have your lookbook. People see, can shop basically on your Instagram page and see something that they like and go on your website and purchase it. Um, and you use meaningful tools on Instagram as well. I noticed that um, when we put something called Linktree in our Instagram, which is, you know, if you go on Instagram, you only get one link, right? And it's like, you get one chance. It, you, what do you put? Do you put your website? Do you put your, you know, your fundraising page? What is it? But Linktree is this one link that allows you to have multiple um, links within your Instagram. So once a um, potential customer comes and clicks on your Linktree, then they see different routes where they can go. They can go to our Shine registry. They can go to our, you know, our website. They can go to our blog. And that has been really, really helpful because it keeps people on our platform a little bit longer. And we noticed that it has drove the most um, traffic to our website more than when we just had notsland.com there. Yeah, great advice. So, you know, through this, this online journey, as I alluded to at the beginning of the call, you've been featured by Google, you've been featured by YouTube, you've been featured by, by Facebook. How did, how did those relationships come about? How did you um, kind of elevate your brand to that level to, to be able to be featured by such uh, you know, large companies that, that are supporting you? 
I think honestly, it's all been very, very organic in that we've done, I, I'd say what we've done really well has been like, know who we are, what we do and package our story, right? So, you know, I'm a black woman in predominantly menswear space and making bow ties and sustainable. And that real that stands out, right? I mean, it, we key in on the things that make us stand out. I mean, especially in a crowded market and against our, our competitors, it's like, oh, wow, this is like, <laughs> there's all of the things I love. There's sustainability, there's black owned business, there's all of these things like, what what is it about this company and people want to learn more and then from there from you know leaning on our uniqueness and what makes us different we've sort of been able to um, cultivate those meaningful relationships very cool so you, you just alluded to it that the um sustainability piece of your business is, is something that that is you know kind of really core to knots land um mm. and i've heard knots land described as an, an equitable circular economy brand Mm -hmm. um, which is a bit of a mouthful, yeah. but I'm, I'm curious, you know, what does that mean to you? How, how do you think about um, creating a sustainable business as you continue to, to think about the future of Knott's Land? Yeah, yeah, um, really good question. And it is a mouthful, but it's important because we have to communicate what we do and why we're so passionate because it's so much work. Um, we... I have been very, very, very inspired by the idea of circular economy and, and circular economics and collaborative economics for a very, very long time. And I knew that, you know, like the sustainability piece, I wanted to create, you know, an equitable space for fashion, for sustainability, more representation in fashion and sustainability specifically when it comes to um, accessories. So, in hindsight, when I started building Nosland, it was like these, these building blocks, right? It was always the building blocks. We didn't know how we were going to get there, but I knew that I wanted to keep sustainability and also help the community and, and you know, provide meaningful opportunities for folks. So, you know, the sustainability for part came first, and then we started to build out this, um, what we call affectionately our social network, which is a network of 22 women who um, sew from home, and they make our products here locally in the region all around the, the, the city and outside of the city um, and help us keep our production up. So that, that's the circular is, is taking this idea of something um, that are reclaimed materials, something that is pretty much deemed unusable and unwanted and, and putting it back into the lifespan and not allowing it to be into landfills while also creating jobs and meaningful income opportunities and like meshing those things. And that's where the circularity comes from because the end result is this beautiful product that is on your neck and it goes to the customer and the customer then shares the story. And it's been this cool thing where it's like, you see a lot of sustainable brands and you outright know that they're sustainable brands. But I think for Nosland, when people see our bow ties out in the world, they're not immediately saying like, that's a sustainable product. Like, you know, it's more so like, oh, that's a cool bow tie. And then it opens up the conversation about sustainability and about, you know, economic opportunities and about all of these things that are really, really important and pack and they're all packaged up into this one little bow tie. I love it. Um, so we've been talking so much about the product, and, and I am admittedly probably not the best model here. Um, but I, I, I'm curious, do you have any, any bow ties handy you want to show off? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'm going to grab these two. And I'm also going to show some masks, too, so I'm going to grab Yeah, them. yeah, please. Okay, so I grabbed a couple bow ties here that I think will show up really well on here. And they're some of my favorite, mostly because um, across the past couple years, we've used materials just in their basic um, form. We've taken them straight from, you know, sourcing, rescuing, reclaiming, and back into production cycle. But this particular collection we did was where we took our logo and we um, sort of created an abstract print and printed it on our reclaimed materials um, with non-toxic ink 
with a printer down the street, Meshwork Letterpress. So it's been cool to see like different things that you can do with um, sustainable materials outside of just using them in their current state, which they're beautiful in their current state, but you know, just figuring out how to add even more special elements to them. Very oh, cool. Can I show the masks now? Yeah, or please. So great, great, great. No, it's a perfect segue. We'd love to, to, to see the masks and we can talk a little bit about um, kind of that, that, that pivot as well. Okay, cool. So here are a couple of our masks, which we've started making um, like many, many other makers uh, during this time in our world. And they're also made from reclaimed materials, but we actually, it's the first time we've sort of bought new things and we've gotten this like organic cotton to line the inside of it so that it does still sort of feel a little bit more um, newer, especially because it's a product that goes on your face, but the outer is still um, cleaned uh, reclaimed materials. Yeah, and I, I will say I've got a couple of Knott's Lands masks and I have gotten quite a few compliments on, on the masks. They're, they're, they're beautiful and, and very comfortable as well. Um, so, so, you know, I think now that we've kind of seen the product and, and understand, you know, kind of physically how, how the brand pivoted, walk us through kind of how, how COVID has impacted your business and, and when did you kind of realize that things were changing and, and how did you start to transition from there? Oh my gosh, COVID, scariest time in the world. Um, you know, we were coming into our fifth year and we were excited. We had a bunch of things laid out in terms of like, you know, we call this our restructuring year, right? Like we're like, hey, we're gonna figure out exactly what part of the market, because people love bow ties, everyone loves bow ties, but we, we were like, how do we hone in some of this data that we've had over the past five years and really create a meaningful um, few segments that we sort of stand firm in. Um, and then uh, just in February, we launched our design your own bow tie um, experience, which we do still have that, it's by appointment only, but it was this idea that we would have like one-off pieces of fabric and like leftovers from our collection. And we're like, why not invite the customer in to design their own piece? Um, and we launched that in February. And then soon after, it was a successful event and it was great. But then soon after we got um, the notice of the shutdowns. And that was like probably the scariest time because it was like, I mean, we just moved into a shop to a storefront. We hadn't even been here for a year. And to know that we had to be closed and, and it was sort of out of our control as a business owner was, it, it was a moment for sure. It was a moment. And, you know, that first week I sat there just trying to figure out what was next. Um, a lot of our weddings, which was what we counted on in the um, spring, our, our weddings and our our sort of larger orders are what really hold us through just the spring. And man, those phone calls started coming, those emails started to come in and which unfortunately it, it, the result of it is me having to call our work from home um, social network and say like, hey, we've lost these projects. And that is the, the hardest thing. I mean, that's, part, that's the reason why we do it, right? Um, and so then, after maybe like a week or two of just like being in a, a really, really sad <laughs> business place, uh, we started, well, I started seeing this like call for masks and this this sort of like shortage in masks and, and all of these things on the news and coming out of New York and, and people were sending me articles. And to be honest, I was still in a place where I was just like, I don't know if I I don't even know how to partake in that and, and are we big enough to partake in that and are we you know established enough and all of these things and then we looked around and I'm like you know how do we do what we do best which is like serve our community and 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 at least start small like it, it's better than not doing anything at all so we started collaborating with a number of different business owners and, and organizations and nonprofit. There was Radiant Hall, there was Proto Haven, there's um, Firecracker Fabrics, um, Cut and Sew, and we brought together Curve Case, all these organizations and our expertise, and we would have a meeting every week, literally figuring out like, how do we 
be a part of the solution. And in Nosline at the time we were, it was me because I had already like told people we didn't have projects and really didn't have money to pay folks. So it was me in here sort of making masks day in and day out to sort of start to get this like mask cycle rolling. And those masks were really for the community and for people with um, low to no access to them and grocery store workers and, and you know, older people who had to still go to appointments and really figuring out how we can like have access. And they were all free. They were also like pay what you can. And fortunately that pay what you can model had gathered us enough support and money to start to bring on our sewists again and, and start to rehire some of the folks to help us fulfill mask order and help us um, participate in this, uh, this, this challenging, challenging space. And I think back on that six weeks where we were just in the weeds and I mean, it was insane to participate in and the rapid prototyping that had to happen to create masks, it, you go from like teaching yourself how to make a thing, tweaking this thing, figuring out the materials that are needed for this thing. And then, I mean, leaning on our strength, which is our so from home. And we, we already, well, a lot of companies were going remote. We were already a remote workforce. Um, but the part of our remote workforce that, that we needed to figure out was the, the learning part, right? We were bringing on new people and how do we teach them and, and ensure quality from a distance learning um, perspective. So that was the biggest challenge was like, how do we continue to have these um, conversations virtually and, and still get people paid, get people into <laughs> the ecosystem and able to participate in opportunities that they need, you know? So we were able to provide quite a bit of income over those over the past six, seven months, just in the masks and the, the Sew From Home program. So I, I'd love to, to drill in a little bit more there. How, how did you manage that remote training and remote onboarding and getting people up to speed um, on, on a, a new product and a new market and, and new sewists as well? It's a, lo a lot of new things. How, how did you do all of that remotely? Uh, with support, support. I mean, we have a volunteer community um, that helps us out with our fabric intake and our breaking down of our materials, but we also have a production manager who I was able to bring back in to, you know, sort, we, we were like alternating schedules and I had to make sure that she knew how to make them really, really well. So she was the first person to start. Like there was just me by myself and then we brought on the production manager to start making them and she made them from home and, and sort of like refined her skills to be able to now offer the virtual trainings and the samples. You know, there was sort of a package that we developed for each of our new sewists that came in to make sure that they had all the materials. And ultimately it has made us better because it, it helped us create a system around what we were doing as opposed to, you know, having Friday trainings and Saturday trainings and, you know, the flexibility around our people. Cause I mean, these are flexible work from home opportunities. So we have to be flexible with our training and flexible with all of our things. And we hadn't really figured that out. We were just kind of going <laughs> with it as it went. And now COVID has forced us to create more virtual tools to um, deliver that training. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious now, kind of fast forward a couple of months, we, we've, we're all kind of getting a little bit more of a rhythm. W where is the business at now? Are you seeing more, more bow tie demand? Is that, is that rebounding a little bit? Uh, I, I assume people are still shopping for masks. How, how does, how is Nasland operating today? So it's, it's interesting because, you know, we had a period where masks were in extremely high demand in like the first three months um, of the pandemic. And then with the um, George Floyd um, effect, it, for lack of better words, like there was something called Blackout Tuesday, which like created a demand that was like through the roof and then Juneteenth came um, and folks were supporting black owned businesses, which, you know, Blackout Tuesday was like June 4th or 5th and Juneteenth is June 19th. And like, we were just like continuing. It was like <laughs> overwhelming in a way because it, we just weren't ready. I mean, we just added a new product and to be like selling and growing and selling and growing and, and figuring out new shipping systems and new shipping materials and all of that um, packaging for the product was insane. So 
things have slowed down for sure. Um, our weddings have started to come back. A lot of the postponed weddings before have figured out how to do more intimate weddings or like smaller weddings. And so we're getting a lot more weddings. We had um, a couple design your own bow ties. So things are starting to get a little bit more um, in rhythm, but it, it's, it's definitely an unpredictable space because I also noticed, you know, we had all of these like influxes and orders. And then once the unemployment and there was no stimulus, like people definitely started being a little more um, cautious and, and, and aware of where they're spending, rightfully so. So there, we definitely seen some dip off. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things you alluded to a couple of the uh, kind of the events where you, you saw a bit of a surge in demand. One I'd love to to hear a little bit about was the, the collaboration with T-Pain and kind of taking part in, in Small Business Live. How did that come about? What How, how was that relationship? So, <laughs> again, as with many of the other um, opportunities, it's just this like serendipity, right? It's like we're sharing our story, we're sharing what we're doing. And um, there was a Business Time article, uh, Julia Miracle, um, a writer for the Business Times had been following us for a quite a, like at least five or six weeks and doing an article for the Business Times that was also launched in the um, National Business Times. And that's where this company, they were looking for businesses to pair with musicians for this um, concert series. And the concert series was to raise money for um, small businesses impacted by COVID. And it, when they approached us, I was like, oh, cool, this is great. You know, we're going to be paired with other musicians. And I didn't necessarily think it would be a T-Pain <laughs> level musician. And then they were like, oh, yeah, and you're paired with T-Pain. I was like, whoa, holy moly. And we get this information and they're like, yeah, you can send him some bow ties and <laughs> he's going to share your story. And it was, it was kind of a wild moment in the midst of like all of the craziness that was already going on. It's like, it doesn't even feel real, but yeah, it happened. It happened and it was really cool. And we were able to um, raise some funds from that. That's awesome. That's really exciting. So, Nisha, what, what is next for Knott's Land? Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now. There's, there's, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of question marks. But, you know, how, how do you keep moving Knott's Land forward? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty. We are, I mean, we've applied for quite a few programs and haven't necessarily um, gotten any of the government resources or different programming because we couldn't prove that we weren't that we lost money because we had the masks. So it's like been like this like idea where it's like, you know, we, we stepped into the plate and did a thing and now we're kind of not <laughs> benefiting um, on the other end, which is okay and also scary because now that that um, rush is over, we're still start, sort of like getting our footing and saying like, what is next? Like, what, what are we doing? And I think these days we're taking it day by day and just reaching out to our contacts and saying like, hey, if anyone is, looking for masks. Um, we have that sort of ecosystem set up to provide them. We're currently working on a, a pretty fairly large order for um, a company in Florida that's sending them to Puerto Rico. Um, and so that that's a really meaningful project and it's an opportunity to sort of um, participate and, and again, engage. I think the, the biggest thing for me is trying to find leads and accounts that that help us continue to provide flexible income to people, especially in a pandemic, right? It's like, we want to still be able to ride this out so that people can still make that um, income that they were making. And so I, that's just what I've been focused on is sort of like developing that, that pipeline of leads and, and continuing to stay busy um, for as long as we possibly can. And, and let's say if you were wants to be one of those people they want to they want to get involved they they want to find knots land w where should they be looking uh they can find us on instagram all of our social medias are at knots land um and they can also uh stop by the shop wednesday through saturday 
Um, we're pretty much by appointment when it comes to our design your own experience. But if it's just, you know, you're here for a mask or a bow tie, you can just pop in. Very cool. So with that, I will open the floor to questions. So if anyone is, is attending live here and would like to, to share a question on through the chat, um, I encourage you to do so. And, and we've gotten a couple come in already. Um, so we've got a question. Uh, where do you draw inspiration for your bow tie designs? Obviously, they're, they're all very creative, as, as I can attest to with, with my small collection. Um, where do the ideas come from? That is an amazing question. And it is one that has challenged us up until like the past two years, because we could just create one off, like, oh, this, this would be a great bow tie. This would be a great bow tie. And we started growing and we realized we can't do everything one of a kind. And so what we started to do is create collections and create collections based off of themes, based off of, you know, meaningful experiences. And so that's what we've sort of leaned on is this idea of um, just cre creating like, what is the collection first before we even go and look at fabric because we just have endless <laughs> styles of fabric like the in endless colors endless combinations and so we have to before we even go and look at fabric think of the theme and that's why i love weddings because wedding customers usually just come in they know what they want they already have their theme and we just kind of curate the fabrics for them and help them design and co-design um collections with them. Another collection that we just um, were on the tail end of finishing up is one for Locally Sourced, which is an exhibition that will be at the Carnegie Museum. Um, our bow ties will be actually a part of the exhibition for a year long, and, and it's, it's going to be really, really cool, so I'm, go check it out. But they gave us historic great textiles that they had to remake into bow ties and I can't believe they trusted us with these textiles but <laughs> they the collection is pretty beautiful. I'm excited to check that out that's very cool. Um, another question we just got was will you consider expanding to other sustainable clothing items beyond bow ties and masks? That is a great question. Um, yes the, the, the answer is yes we actually just launched um, uh, a sub collection in our brand called Notslandia. It's a tab on our site right now, but we're building that out to be a platform for designers, emerging um, sustainable designers, specifically in the zero waste space to come and sort of work with us and explore our products and help us co-design new products um, with our materials because we never have thrown away any of our scraps and it we're just excited to welcome more people and and invite more people in to help us co-design and also launch their own product lines um, from zero waste uh, practices very cool um and then one more question just came in. Um, where have you found is the best place to find recycled fabric? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> these are all really good questions and, and totally on point. Um, we are very, very, very first and most used source is um, the Pittsburgh Center for Creative Reuse. Um, it's in Point Breeze by Construction Junction. And anytime we need materials, they actually have an online store now and they will ship directly to your house, which is incredible. But anytime we need materials um, that we don't have in studio, if we're looking for a specific color or anything, we need more black fabric for something, we go there first and um, we check them out and see if they have anything. And if they don't have anything, we generally will go, we have a um, list of sourcing partners that we have um, engaged over the past couple of years. And they're broken down from like upholstery partners and furniture stores and different companies that um, are sourcing. We have a sourcing and sustainability coordinator and she's the one who will you know, reach out to different organizations that we're connected to and say like, hey, do you happen to have any more of that? X fabric um, and, and sort of that sort of thing. Awesome. Well, so those those are all of the questions we got from from the audience here, Nisha. And anything else you'd like to share about Knots Land? Um, no, just that Knots Land has been one of the greatest things that has ever happened to me um, as as a person. 
it has given me like this purpose and this this outlet for pouring into um, just all of the energy, the creative energy. I worked at many different places and been like, you know, felt I wasn't able to fulfill this creative side of me. And, you know, Knott's Land has been that part that has really allowed me to explore the creativity, but also the business side and say like, hey, like the business side is probably the most growth and challenge that I've been through over the past couple of years, which is also great because um, you can't really grow any creative venture without participating and, and knowing your numbers and knowing your, your strategy and building those things. So it's just been this all encompassing experience and, and just the people that we attract to work at Knott's Land, our social network, our volunteer network, like just the, the amazing community that we've built around reuse, our, our customers, our supporters, the people who share our stuff. It's just been a really, really beautiful, um, meaningful space for me as a person. And that's just speaking outside, like inside, but on the side of Knott's Land. <laughs> I, I love it. And I, I appreciate so much you, you joining us today and taking the time to, to share your story and just congratulations on building such a great business that, that is so true to, to your own values um, and, and creating something, creating such beautiful products that, that really kind of hold true to, to, to what, what's important to you and, and to so many of us. So thank you, Nisha, for joining us. And I challenge everyone to check out knotsland.com and, and try not to buy something because you're, you're going to get to that site and everything on there is so beautiful and, and, and so much fun to check out. So I uh, encourage everyone to go to knotsland.com. Hey, George, um, thank you so much for having me. And also congratulations to you for building a, a company and, and for all the work that you put in with Honeycomb. I've been following you guys for a while and just incredible work. And, and thank you for all the support that you've given to Knotsland over the years. I mean, just this platform and this, this space to share our story. So thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thanks, Nisha. And of course, uh, I encourage everyone to check out honeycombcredit.com as well and, and see some of the, the live campaigns that are, that are popping up all the time. And there, there's great small businesses that you can support and, and help them on their growth journey uh, as, as they continue to, to evolve through, through COVID as well. So thank you, everyone, for, for joining us this evening. And thanks again to Nisha. And, and best of luck to you.